Can mathematics prevent homelessness? That was the call I got late last, late last year, mid-December, when I was more concerned with whether or not we might have a normal Christmas this year. The Omicron variant was rife and there was a 10-day isolation period. Still, I'd be isolating in relative comfort in my own home, already, already well stocked with food and other essentials. But would the children be able to join me? The call came from Edinburgh City Council. Can maths prevent homelessness? Mathematics to me is well disciplined. It's a subject for rules and structure applied to well structured, disciplined problems, okay, often challenging. Problems like my introduction to virtual study groups in July 2020 when UK first went into lockdown. Estimating the probability of collisions in low Earth orbit satellites. A virtual study group discussing space. Still, a perfect structured example. Applied mathematics, mechanics, probabilistic modeling, statistics, and advanced computer programming. That triage, the trinity of mathematics capabilities. That and the ability to communicate, of course, to interpret our findings in a realistic world manner, write a report. Outside of academia, mathematicians rarely keep their title mathematician. Data scientist is prevalent at the moment. And if you look at most data scientist advertisements, you'll see this typical range of abilities. Data science incorporates the maths, the stats, the computing, computer science, data processing, machine learning. No one person, of course, is expert in all of these. Another huge element is the domain knowledge, the expert knowledge. That doesn't necessarily, or usually, come from the mathematicians. Like me, you might be surprised to find that there's no single definition of homelessness. The shelter, uh, charity Shelter has an approximately 20-point uh, definition, 20 different categories of people or individuals involved in their definition of homelessness. Uh, no surprise, perhaps, that the local authority definition is not quite so broad, but all agree it goes much further than just the people who we see on our streets. It includes those who are in temporary or unsuitable accommodation, those with imminent threat of eviction, or families that can't be in the single location, who are spread in different um, centres of housing. The number one strategic policy of, the Edinburgh, of Edinburgh Council is to prevent homelessness. Can maths prevent homelessness? Where do we start? Well, a sensible place to start is as to get some idea um, of how to quantify the problem. A time series analysis of applications for homelessness in the, to the council, to Edinburgh Council, over the last few years. Analyzing the charts, there was an obvious increase right up until last year when there was dramatic fall, 44% drop in applications. Unfortunately, that's not the eureka moment that we would hope it to be. That 44% probably represents a backlog in the courts 
due to the stay of execution over the pandemic period, pending applications to the Council for Homeless Support. The Council are also facing a couple of policy changing changes. The first one is the removal of the local, author local authority con connection policy, which means that a homeless individual doesn't have to have either a personal or a family connection to the authority in they're applying to. They can um, freely apply across any council that is best for them. What is the likely impact on Edinburgh? It's an attractive city, of course. Will its streets be thought to be paved with gold? We know many, many homeless migrate to London, to capital cities, or large cities. We don't have any data on homeless migrations. It doesn't exist. They're not registered persons, always. But what we do have, we have household migration data. That's collected by the census every 10 years. I'm using that to, as a proxy variable to mimic homeless migrations highlights that the increases are likely to be relatively small, maybe half a dozen additional applications. A more substantial change in policy is predicted. And that's the policy which is called the duty of prevention. And the duty of prevention currently lasts as a support over a two month period if required on application as homeless and the change in policy is to increase this to a six month period a reasonable up bound a rough estimate for on resources would be three times the current number of applications but the policy goes further than that the idea is to proactively seek out vulnerable individuals and families and offer support two months prior to the eviction catastrophe. That makes a different story. Offering assistance two months prior to the eviction, surely there's time to divert the course of some of these uh, people's fate interventions, education, support. But how? How do we identify who is vulnerable so that we can target them two months in advance? What's the structure? Who's vulnerable? Well, we know some target groups, some groups of um, vulnerable people are well known uh, care leavers, substance abusers, or refugees, for example. And we many, many more, we need to find a way of identifying those groups who are at risk. We need to examine the structure, not just identify the groups, identify the patterns, of how they progress to be in the situation they are now, how we can help intervene, where we can divert them from a worsening situation into one of improving fortune. Any system that changes over time is a dynamic system. Modeling, looking at changes in weather patterns, changes in fluid mixture. They're all dynamic systems. They change over time. Different applications have different specifics, but every dynamical system has the same fundamental components. There's a current state, data. There are a number of variables that we can control to an extent maybe but certainly we can observe and then there are response variables we don't have control over 
We may not even be able to directly measure, but we may be able to find a proxy variable, as we did with the homeless migrations. All of these quantities, all of these changing variables, are wrapped up in the functionality, the dynamic system. So it could be something like uh, Newton's second law. That's a dynamic system. We use dynamic systems to model real-world scenarios and investigate the behavior of systems. There are many challenges, though. Many, many challenges. For example, most modern-day systems are not known, and they'll need to be inferred, perhaps, if possible, through the data. And from the data, we're developing methods of finding underlying dynamical systems. There are other challenges, in, uh, scale invariant challenges, thinking about weather forecasting, thinking about fluctuations on a daily basis over a season, over a longer period of time. Fluctuations due to a little breeze in the summer or a huge hurricane. Massive scale differences. And also the uncertainty. There's always errors. How do we model and account for the variation in me measurements that's not due to the system that we're observing? Each of these challenges, and many more, are in themselves huge research areas. Each one of them is a career in its own right. But what does the dynamical system for homelessness look like? Well, surprisingly, it looks like maths. It didn't just appear, and it certainly wasn't all done by mathematicians. The system's compartmental model has to be an accurate reflection of the situation. That has to be developed and validated by experts in the field. If that's not right, no amount of fancy calculus and predictions will make any difference whatsoever. If the model and the categorization, the flows between categories, the links, the intercorrelations, between the groups, if that's incorrect, that's the foundation and everything else is of little use. So that takes time. It may not be exactly the right model as yet. It may need greater granularity. We might have to hone down, resub the categories find other divisions, diff um, make sure we incorporate all the paths. But for the moment, we can accept it as a reasonable working model. The procedural transformation from the model to the coupled differential equations, that's just a standard mathematical uh, procedure. That's not, it's not, don't, not to be underestimated, but that's not the hugely tricky part in here. So we have a formula. Well, we have a generic formula. You might notice there are a host of coefficients in there. Kappa 1, Kappa 2. The rates, the risks associated with each of these flows, each of these transfers from one state to another. They're the huge challenge for the next phase. So I suppose we could say, at phase one, we have an achievement, we have a model, which we do believe will work. We don't believe in it implicitly. We know it will need testing and re-evaluating. But the structure is there, the formulae are there, and we have a conclusion to the first phase 
of this homelessness analysis. So yes, I would say homelessness can prevent Maths can prevent homelessness. It's not supposed to be interchangeable. It can help. It will prevent homelessness in some cases. This was a team event. Noticeably, it was a team between mathematicians and experts. People, experts in the area with the right domain knowledge to tackle the problem. We'll be forming a new team. The project's going to continue in Huddersfield. Over the summer, the new team and our interns will work on the next phase. We'll scrutinize the data, scrutinize the literature, and parameterize the model. We'll get a stage, or hopefully, where we can practice the model on real data. We can check its accuracy, we can re-parameterize, and so on. It's an iterative process. The data is freely available. You could be involved. You could do an analysis, find an innovative way to reconsider the problem, do the research, the 21st century is going to have many challenges. They can all be solved with mathematics. The team or teams require new generations of enthusiastic, creative individuals. Those individuals could be you. Um, have you always known that you wanted to be a mathematician? How did, how did you get to, to this point? Well, that's a very good question. Um, I suppose going back far enough, um, no. I was always intent on being a story writer. Either that or a monkey keeper. Or maybe I did have a romantic notion that I'd run away with the circus and become a trapeze artist. I always enjoyed maths, though. I always enjoyed the challenge, working out problems. Equally, I enjoyed um, other subjects, descriptive, written subjects. So at what point did you realise in that journey and that love of maths that it could actually be a career for you? Was, <laughs> there, was there a point or did you just kind of flow into this amazing research? I'm afraid it's more the latter. I don't think I ever made, um, I don't recall making a conscious decision I just remember being involved and continuing doing maths, doing some more maths, being offered an opportunity to work in this area or that area. I, I think one of the wonderful things is that because there are so few of us, because we're in such short supply, I do get, you do get offers from all sorts of different quarters, which is excellent. And uh, it, the research that I've known you do is, is vastly diverse. We've got homelessness. I know that you've done some research in a big noisy lab on campus where there's a lot of machines and, and a lot of engineering. So it has really given you a very diverse career, hasn't it? It has, but that said, one of my main focuses with those noisy machines at the moment is determining underlying dynamical systems for engineering processes with a view to um, creating digital twins. So that the links across the disciplines are surprisingly similar. Dif very, very different models, different parameterization, but the same process. Fantastic. You've explained that a large part of your work was working with a, a big team, a really diverse, multidisciplinary team. Um, I suppose some people might think of mathematics as being a very individual activity if they think back to school and, and sort of focusing on their mathematical studies. Do you still get to work as an individual on those areas that you're really passionate about? Oh, yeah. 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 The optionality is there. Individual, individual as part of a team, contributing to a greater project, or individual pursuing your own interests. Definitely, yeah. Good question. So the question, Anne, was... What do you think your main challenge is going to be in taking your research further? My research, as in 
generally my research will um, I, do, I I think How it's about more specifically a case to the homeless project maybe because it's specific so broad when you think yeah, of all your research. It is, it's just huge. Um, specifically to the homeless project, I think one of the greater um, challenges will be um, collating the data. There's a huge amount of data. It isn't always exactly the um, precise uh, piece of data or the data isn't always collated as we want. Often, in fact, not even the same units are used and we don't want to end up like NASA. <laughs> so probably it's the scrutiny and the collation of the information that is out there. I suppose also identifying the gaps where we don't have the information that we do require to uh, parameterize the model. And then the bigger challenge will be to find suitable approximations or proxy variables to replicate those values. Great, thank you. Brilliant question. Okay, so that question on a similar theme, it's all about the challenges today, Anne. Yeah. What do you find most challenging and most enjoyable about what you do? Well, I suppose to answer fairly simplistically, the challenge is often getting into the problem. It's understanding the, um, the background of the, uh, the nature, say, the domain knowledge. It's getting into the question and finding all the relevant resources. The most, um, what was the, the most, most enjoyable? The most enjoyable, I suppose, um, milestones, hitting milestones, for get, um, achieving the goals as you're working through the project and um, gradually seeing that something of worth is coming out. Not that um, you know, we always have to have a positive result to, to be of worth, but it's nice to hit a milestone and find that satisfaction. It of, is, of yeah. The, yeah. yeah. Brilliant. Yeah. So, so jump in if I'm incorrect, but I think the, um, the first question was on the difference between prediction and prevention. So how do those two vary in your research and where the focus is? And then once we've got that information, what do we do with it? Do we um, provide the housing or do we tackle the social issues? So, and I suppose that, that second question is very much the third phase of research. So, so yeah. focusing on that first element. Okay, I'll try and answer that in some kind of an order. Obviously, it's a huge socio-economical problem. It's much bigger than mathematics on the, if you come from the uh, periphery. The purpose of our modelling is to understand the process initially, is to understand the flows, to do a critical path analysis and identify the crucial points. If we can find crucial points where a trajectory is either diverted to the better or becomes or deteriorates, then we can spend energy and money educate in education, in intervention programs at those crucial points. So that way, the two, prevention, predict, we would have some means of predicting. Predicting numbers is, um, we could do that with the time series analysis as I discussed when we first came, uh, I first came into the analysis. That is, is useful, it's useful in terms of resources, resource allocations, but prevention is the real crucial question here. That's the question that we would prefer to answer if that's within our capabilities. Okay. Oh, that's an interesting question. So we've heard about a few of the various areas of your oh, research. Yeah. What's been the most rewarding research to date? That is such a tricky question. That is such a difficult question. I suppose um, in selfish terms, in terms of the one that had the greater impact on me, it would have, and that caused me the greatest amount of anxiety, it has to be my PhD research. <laughs> and what, what was that research on, just briefly? Yeah, my PhD research was the, the interface of 
statistical inference and engineering processes. So yet another project on top of the ones we've already heard about. Fantastic. Thinking yeah. about the methodologies that you've mm. implemented in the homelessness project, are there any other applications that you can see for that? Well, yes, we've already been involved, here we go again, in um, a more recent study group looking at hospital discharges and um, aftercare. Um, so again, a very similar sort of simulation style model compartmentalized. But I would see that still within the homeless um, concept, this model wouldn't be singularly um, applicable to Edinburgh. I would hope that it would be generalizable, albeit with a renewed set of parameters, it should be generalizable nationally.